everyone. Welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 123rd New Social Environment. My name is Catherine. I have the pleasure of being your MC today for a conversation with Ito Barada and Yasi Alipur. We're also thrilled to have the poet Theresa Porian here who will read to close today's program. The Brooklyn Rail acknowledges that we are on the unceded territory of the Lenni Lenape, Canarsi, Shinnecock, and Muncie peoples. We acknowledge the many indigenous nations with ties to this land, and we recognize that the Lenape still call Manahata home. Finally, the Brooklyn Rail stands in solidarity with the uprising unfolding across the country following the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Nina Pop, David McAdee, James Skurlock, Jamel Floyd, Ahmed Arbery, Richard Brooks, Raya Milton, Dominique Remy Fells, and Toyin Salau and in response to generations of structural violence against Black communities. Black Lives Matter, and we will continue to support ongoing action in the struggle for racial justice. Before I introduce our host, we'd like to begin with a brief moment of silence. Thank you. And now to introduce today's host, Yasi Alipour is an Iranian artist, writer, and folder who currently lives in Brooklyn and wonders about paper, politics, and performance. She is a teacher at Columbia University and SVA and is currently a resident at the Sharp Valenta Studio Program. Yasi, take it away. <laughs> Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, I must say I'm very excited for this talk. I'm going to start with a brief official um, introduction to Ito, uh, whatever that is, and then a bit of my rambling. And hopefully after that, we can jump into this incredible, complicated, urgent, um, paradoxical, humorous, and everything else work. Um, to start with, Ito Barada um, works and lives in New York. She's a Moroccan French artist um, recognized for her multidisciplinary investigations into cultural phenomena and historical narratives, engaging with archival practice and public interventions. Barada's installations uncover lesser known histories, reveal the prevalence of fiction in institutionalized narratives and celebrates everyday forms of reclaiming autonomy. That's a good sentence. Uh, she's the founder of Cinematheque de Tangier, uh, an art house cinema and a cultural center that has become a landmark institution bringing the Moroccan community together to celebrate local and international cinema. Um, and then I'm gonna briefly go through everything Gita has done. Um, she's won numerous awards, including, including the Nuremberg Prize in 2019, the Rotterdam Film Festival, uh, the Prix Marcel Duchamp nomination, the Abraj Group Art Prize, Robert Gardner Fellowship in Photography, and the Deutsche Guggenheim Artist of the Year. Her work has been at the Met, Tate Modern, MoMA, Guggenheim, Santa Pompidou, um, and, and I'm gonna pause the official intro there. Um, it has kind of been an interesting journey uh, going through all the writing around your work, Hito, and I found myself to constantly have this process of reading the language around your work and how people discuss it and be like, yes, but there's more. Uh, there are people who talk about your relationship to history and oral history, to the legacy of um, what it means to be post-colonial and the complexity of that, to your relationship to anthropology, uh, to play and games. And I was like, yes, it's all that, but still none of that. There's a quote of yours uh, that I found somewhere, and I think you were discussing one of your pieces where you said, the whole thing is a dance between a mad poet, children, and ghosts. And I think that's where I find your work. You have this early piece that is still one of my favorites. Um, that is these studies on um, cookbooks and phone books that your grandmother used to keep 
Um, and as an illiterate woman, she had kind of created her own language to uh, write the phone book and the cookbook. And you went through it thinking about that language. I remember that has been my process with it. Partially, I find that piece to be so moving just to think about how do we discuss. Um, I don't claim to know all post-colonial experiences. I barely know the Middle East. Um, but at least as an Iranian, uh, how do we tell these histories that are full of contradiction, full of humor and oppression and from all sides and languages that can't be read uh, but have to be stared at. On that note, um, thank you for accepting our invitation. Uh, Tyler, we can start the uh, PowerPoint. Uh, to look at the images. Um, why don't you get us started, Ito? Hello, hi, Esty. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Book and Rail, for having me. Um, so, your question about the, uh, the dance, the dance, uh, mm -hmm. was about a piece called Dance Macabre, which is a mobile uh, made of wicker, house um, pieces, handmade wicker house uh, objects hanging at the Barbican Art Center in London for a show called Agadir. Mm -hmm. um, and today is the month anniversary of the um, earthquake. Oh, oh. <laughs> it's funny that I called it earthquake. Uh, so it was a disaster of the explosion in Beirut. And right. the Agadir project was about another disaster. It was about uh, uh, the 1960 uh, destruction after an earthquake of the modern city of Agadir in Morocco. Um, I based the project on a poem that was made by a bureaucrat sent to do a report and he comes back with this um, surreal poem uh, with invented language. Khairdin, uh, Mohammed Khairdin, Khairdin. And the, the translation just um, came out recently in English. We had some pieces done and now the finished translation by uh, Pierre Joris and um, I'm sure this will be other translators, but Pierre Joris uh, is just available now. The pieces you see in the images uh, are a project I did. It's a different commission. It's for um, the house and studio of uh, another uh, a Mexican architect called uh, Luis Barragan who I was told was inspired by uh, Moroccan architecture in his work. I think that's one main reason sometimes I'm invited. <laughs> um, and there's not much to add in the, in the, in the house and studio. It's quite beautiful. There's this famous fish meal clink from that insect that you make dyes of that, are, that is on the walls of the house. And mm -hmm. before me, there was Jan Vo and Frank Charles Walter, who did amazing series of work. So I um, decided to be guided by the books in his library, in his bookshop. And I found a few books on um, Moroccan um, grain citadels to hold the, the wheat. Um, uh, what are they called? The, that's what actually what Agadir means in Berber. The, the place where oh. you, you keep the, the grain, it's a collective. Um, um, Ito, sorry to interrupt you. It seems like people are having a bit of a hard time hearing you. Um, can we just, uh, maybe you can move things or just yell at it? Like this? I think it's better. Um, like this, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. This is much better. Great, great. Um, so oh, I didn't know. I did there mean that uh, in Berber. It's interesting. It's okay, go on. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's a collective villagers mm -hmm. um, vault that for the wheat grain. I have to, somebody can look it up, the word in English, for Gonye. Uh, and, and Baragan had uh, a book of an inventory of, of these um, architectures. Tilo, mm -hmm. yes. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and um, and he had other uh, books that were um, hand um, binded, and I just mm -hmm. decided to pick the ones that looked alike that were hand binded with the same writing and paste papers uh, mm -hmm. 
and uh, and I started this um, project of dyeing something that fitted the house, something quite the house, which is silk velvet and dyed. And I just made a series of colors of mm. with different nuances, each for one room. So right before we started this, I was uh, I was telling you that when I saw the order of the images you gave me, I was like, damn, like that's a hard project to start with. Because for me, it brings a lot of the different questions you've been asking in the past couple of years, uh, your relationship with architecture and thinking about architecture. Uh, I was really interested in like going for these last pages of these books. So kind of having a dialogue with Baragam, but like with this page that isn't um, in any language. But it, I was also fascinated with the history of um, like natural dye, both in Morocco and in Mexico, and your process of learning, like teaching yourself how to do it. If I'm not wrong, you've been experimenting with natural dye for the past couple of years. Um, there's something in that that I find interesting. It's like what it means to create this conversation between this location that has a lot of meaning to you this space where you've had the invitation. There's something about the quietness of the way you talk with Baragam, because you're in his house that is like a cultural space now and cannot move things, right? So there's a conversation happening between your objects. Anyway, any thoughts on those things? Or you can tell me they're pretty and I need to stop. <laughs> oh, that's a witch ball in the corner. Whoa. Um, Victorian witch ball. He, he likes very much. Damn. <laughs> they're made of the glass mirror balls. I collect them too. Um, that you put in a corner of your room. Um, to what what are they the supposed to do? Eye. Well, the evil eye turns oh. because it's, it's in French, it's called a sorcière. You know, it's like those mirrors that are half bombed, uh, like bull eye that you mm -hmm. turn an entrance. It's the same principle. It's the idea that the jnun or the evil eye, the jinn, are going to get lost because Whoa. of the corners. Uh, yeah, but I got a, a oh, an God. interesting figure, a Catholic, gay, uh, baroque, but very simple uh, in the lines. Um, there's a lot of austerity. Uh, the the um, painting that you see in the image is a tool for a dyer. Um, mm. when, when you start dyeing, uh, you have to test the colors that you have available because it changes with the pH of the water. Mm. If it's your own plants or the plants you bought, it depends how they were um, taken care of. So everybody's uh, color sample changes. And so mm. the first thing a dye does is you make your own color sample to find out um, what you can do. And each textile also reacts differently. Cotton, silk, here it's silk velvet. Mm -hmm. with the same quantities of uh, dye will have a different um, uh, tonality. Uh, mm -hmm. What's interesting for me in dyes is that dyes are not pigments. It's not painting. They're part of the structure. It's like an architectural textile. is like a construction. And the dyes go inside. They're embedded. They mm -hmm. belong. Um, mm -hmm. The oldest textiles that we, uh, some of the most beautiful ones are from Peru. Uh, and there's a whole history of the traditions of using plants and insects. It seems to mm. be on the top. There's a cross here. There's uh, three colors that are crossed. There's indigo. Um, the yellow is Rivida, and the uh, Kushnil, is, uh, which is an insect. Uh, mm. um, and uh, Mexico in the 17th, 18th century had the monopoly of these colors. What I was interested in when I started taking classes in Brooklyn here at the Textile Arts Center, um, when I was a resident a few years ago, was the coincidence that the history of dyes have to do with an aesthetic history, an economic history, uh, a history of colonial influences and also races, you know, to, mm -hmm. to get access to the, to the resource. Mm. Uh, and also today, because most of the natural dyes disappeared in the textile industry, uh, mm. it has to do also with the transformation of the petrol agroeconomic industry that made them completely disappear. For example, mm. in Morocco, the dyes, the traditional dyes that you see 
they dye leather, you know, those very picturesque photographs of the dyers. Mm -hmm. none, of, none of it is natural. Um, mm. But the, the pharmaceutical uh, industry who sells the products, they give it exactly the same name as a mm. traditional dye. So matter mm. is called matter for the person who goes to buy it, the powder, and it's cheaper, but it's mm. terribly toxic. Um, fascinating. It, um, people are noticing that your voice is still hard to hear. I think we're going to make you yell by the end of this. Um, can we try? I'm usually very See? loud. Mostly I'm supposed <laughs> to be quiet, not to be louder. <laughs> Maybe it's like all part of the big bigger plan to make you. Um, can we try to see if things are okay? Um, but I forgot it, your question, so you'll need to redirect me. To I will, I will, and I have, no, and something about what you mentioned. So, um, wait, Catherine, can you be in charge of the sound thing and help me figure, help us figure it out? Yeah, Ito, can you try taking off your headphones to see if the sound comes more clearly with that? Is this better like this? I think so. Maybe speak a little closer to your computer and the, the mic might pick up your voice. Is it better like this? I think that's a little better. Yasi, what do you think? Okay. If I stay here? Yes. Yeah. I think this is good. Okay. I'll, I'll uh, uh, I was... Um, I mentioned this another talk. It's like recently I was meeting with a new therapist and I was like, we're too close to one another. Like there's something weird about how close faces are in Zoom. Um, but very glad that your voice will be better. What I wanted to ask, I was actually, it's interesting because when you were saying that, I was thinking about your process, like your project about the false starts. Um, but we'll get there. It, dinosaurs in Morocco. But it was also, when I was thinking about natural... But that's direct link, the question of authenticity. Right, right. Colors, real right. colors. And what like, are, that? Authentic... Sorry, go ahead. No, but I was really interested because the moment I read the word natural dye, all I could think about was part of the process of moving to another place is knowing that like food is different. Like even taste is different, you know? Like, I think me and my Iranian friends are always talking about that one fruit you cannot find in New York. And then I kept thinking how colors change if they are based on plants in that way or rely on these different natural uh, resources. It's also interesting because I keep thinking about um, your work as kind of a next step of a Mark Dion piece. But I was thinking about what happens with the moving of these plants and then the insects and the natural life that is built around them as one way to think about the history of colonialism and displacement. It's also interesting. I feel like each time I'm talking about anything around our region, I'm like, all words are wrong. Like, do I mean colonialism? Am I trying to say the third world? Uh, but yeah, the idea of like the, the fake version that uses the language of the authentic one, uh, there's something in that that has been consistent in your work too. It's not much of a question. It's a bunch of thoughts. I'll do the same thing. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll, bounce, I'll bounce on your thoughts. Uh, um, what I found that was an immense uh, territory for me to dive in mm. was the circulation of ideas and knowledge, the fact that some of it disappeared, some of it is appropriated, the coincidence mm. that indigo is many different plants that mm. have indigo ferro that make blue. But mm. it's, you have it in Africa, you have it in some parts of Africa, you have it in some parts of Japan, and you have mm. it in China, and um, mm. also the um, British um, Celtic would paint their faces blue. So you mm. have all these very specific local traditions. Then you mm. have, um, sumptuary rules almost everywhere, rules of what you're allowed to wear, not allowed to wear, um, a sort of social division that's related to uh, the, the um, 
the permission to wear a certain clothes and then mm. the imagination that comes as a resistance to react to those rules that's mm. specifically to japan mm -hmm. for example but it was also true in morocco and true in other countries where when when um strict rules were applied people would find a way to do and that's something that i'm interested in uh, and then this has to do also with the history of witchcraft and mm. healing because many of the plants that are used to color were close to healing plants and also the mm. accidentally that's how their color power was discovered um mm. as they grew together um mm. and i'm interested in recreating a sort of uh dye garden historical dye garden in morocco mm. i i have a lot of respect for people who are self-taught <laughs> And I'm always learning, and I'm, you know, being dyer. A dyer is a um, grandmaster profession, you know, in the traditional way. Yeah. It takes ten to fifteen years, but they're great masters. And I'd like to create a d garden in Tangier. I've been working on the project for two years now to mm. recreate an educational garden where you can see the plants and see the colors they make, and have also mm. a sort of travel in time to see the different plants that were available disappeared and what was replaced and, mm. and how the exchanges if you take an example for example if you take if you look at carpet motifs and flowers for example that's a great example of circulation it was um dutch uh and european botanists who went to um southeast asia asia mm. made the drawing of the plants they discovered brought them back and then these drawings were copied a few centuries later by carpet makers and then these mm. carpets were collected <laughs> and mm. so you have the um the circulation of of knowledge even at two three hundred years of difference uh, um mm. and none of it is really authentic because mm. it's always influencing it comes from the influence of ceramics in in China, uh, the mm. the flower motifs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I'm mm. very much interested in these lineage mm. and this uh, bastardization. I like bad words. And that's a good <laughs> one. Uh, being, I like that uh, one. Not having a mother tongue helps. Uh, uh, <laughs> I was listening to Marin Arsenio's um, Mm. Uh, presentation that she did for Eflux a few uh, years ago on mm. mother tongue. Mm. Um, mm. And that was sort of a fantastic uh, entry, having multiple languages as a mother tongue. Yeah, I, I mean, a good history. it was interesting. I was, um, when I was prepping, I was like, ask someone who exists in a language that was not mine. I was like, this is a nightmare because I will pronounce all Arabic words with a weird Farsi accent. And then I'm going to pronounce all the French words with a weird American accent. <laughs> it's like language is like kind of crumbling around me. Um, but it also, as you were talking, especially about like the tourism that comes with the idea of the authentic past, I just had a moment thinking about there are like some people in Iran who are like, we're going to speak pure Farsi. It's like before it was interrupted by foreign words. I'm like, that's not how languages work. That's not how languages ever work. Um, but then the other part, and I think this might not be a bad segue to the next project is, I think I heard you say this like in different places, um, but you sometimes talk about how in a structure of oppression, you're interested in the person who's serving the soup, but is spitting in the soup. And I feel like you're constantly trying to tell the story of the spit. I can't even see it, you know? And there's something about that for me that feels like a really honest, contemporary and urgent way of talking about these different locations um, that have a history that is full of contradiction and interruption. Can we go to the next image, Tyler? Yes. Bedroom. Yes. Uh, so free identification for beginners. Yeah. Yes. So this is a still from your video, tree identifications for beginners. And in that video, you the narrative revolves around your mother, who seems like a very fascinating character, 
Um, and then in your videos, you work with these objects. Um, I'm going to do like a brutal intro to the video, which is weird because I think people have to see it. Can I you get back first before you start to uh, yeah. strategies of resistance and mm -hmm. what you said about soup? Mm -hmm. uh, spit in the soup in French means to bite the hand that feeds you. I think that's that would be the equivalent. But mm -hmm. I, I was quoting uh, Jonathan Swift, a book that was pub published after he died. I think it's mm -hmm. 1745, but he wrote it in 1730s, called Directions to Servants. Mm -hmm. And it's a sort of... Um, that's a satirical take on, uh, on um, you know, it, uh, co the conduct book jar, uh, sort of didactic manual that tells you how to behave. And so it's for mm. servants and mm. to reappropriate your, um, I don't like the word dignity at all, so I'll use something else, to reappropriate your uh, selfness, your independence. Mm. Um, there's a series of almost invisible gestures you have to do every day and one of them is to wipe your forehead with uh your lady's uh, bed sheets while if you're sweating <laughs> and another one is to spit in the soup um, <laughs> in french it means to be ungrateful so i found it very interesting okay. and i've been tracing these gestures and one of them is um is the center to this story so this american story about my mother invited here to visit this wonderful grand country in 1966 and she's a very <laughs> ungrateful guest. Uh, I was going to say I'm like I'm someone who's on a visa and I'm getting recorded. I'll be careful about how I tell the story. No what I found really moving about the narrative that the story goes through and I think the form of it is important too was also it's because your mom's figure for me feels familiar and not just a very rare exception. So the way the story goes, she's in Paris, it's the 60s, she's a leftist, everyone's a leftist. They're constantly talking about imperialism and what's happening. And she wants to see America. She wants to know what this imperialist country is, even though a lot of her comrades are critical of it. And then she's looking for a cheap flight. And what she finds is that our operation Crossroad Africa, which is kind of a propaganda project. So then it is the video tells the story of her travels here and all the ways she's rebelling and negotiating and refusing. But also what's really moving about it is it's not just a critique of like, I don't know, the power structure here. She's coming here very excited about the Black Panthers movement, uh, about the Vietnam War protests. She wants to see like the workers and do interviews. But there's a moment where you tell the story of her like entering one of the Black Panthers meetings, holding her Moroccan passport to prove that she is African and she should get access. And there's something about those contradictions that I find really moving. But also the way that it's like the video kind of ends with like a review of how she did. And then I was looking at the kind of the animation you've created to go along the, the narrative. And I always find it hilarious when especially more recent American writers talk about like abstract geometry as this like exotic Islamic thing. Uh, you use a lot of basic forms and they're like, there's constant hierarchies and these objects are moving, um, but you don't give us the image of your mom for us to fetishize or hold on to. Um, but there's often like there, these objects are put in their place. There are moments where it feels like they're trying to leave the screen, but they can't. <laughs> um, so I was thinking about that as both your mom moving, but also how hard it is to tell these stories. And I think you did an interview with Bidoon years ago. And I think I'm quoting, you said, I'm not exotic, I'm exhausted. <laughs> and like that really resonates. And then I want to use this other one, um, other quote, when you said, in a situation of domination, I am interested in how you find a, we, a way to keep your head up. Humor is one way, ruse is another. On that note, um, yeah, this video. Oh, and then I heard somewhere that your mom came back to Morocco and started a Montessori school. And that, for me, really makes sense with her way of continuing her rebellious being, but also with your work and your constant process of like 
learning stuff, like the, the tactile, like having experimentation to find these contradictory histories. I'm done. Oh my gosh, I don't know where to start. <laughs> start with the end. Uh, she didn't start a Montessori school. She participated in, okay. in, in, uh, and helped with a project mm -hmm. in Tangier. But that's a very long, she's a psychotherapist and she was a sociologist, a student of Alain Touraine who's still alive and who's, um, she, she worked mostly with uh, psychotic uh, children for a very long time. Um, in Give a, me a second. I have to, someone is buzzing my door. God knows why. I'll be back in a second. Please stop. Okay, continue. <laughs> uh, she worked with um, children in difficulty. Um, uh, that's most of her life. Uh, in going home, uh, political prisoners, kids, prisoners, children. Uh, uh, she created a school in, in Rabat, then it was closed by the police, and then she reopened in Tangier um, mm. in centers called Dharna for street kids and children in difficulty or out of the school system. And then it grew to be a different uh, number of houses and even a house of women. And um, mm. it's very sad that she closed her whole project a few days ago uh, mm. because it's been six months and they don't see the future of this yeah. project. Uh, but in 1966, she's 20 years old, and um, uh, Crossroad Africa is an organization that, uh, in the beginning, it, it's created by uh, uh, this amazing um, uh, black pastor called uh, Robinson, and he takes American students to the newly independent countries in Africa. Mm. Uh, to help them with governance, agriculture. It's a, it's a wonderful sort of, you know, ancestor of the Peace Corps. Mm. And after doing that from 54 and 58 for the first time, they start doing what is the reverse program, is bringing kids from Africa to America. Mm. And in 66, it's the first time where they have French-speaking kids. That's where my mom mm -hmm. was part of them, 70 plus kids um, who are invited but that tour, this one, this specific program is financed by the State Department. Mm. Uh, Operation Crossroad Africa is independent. It's just that mm. program. Um, and it's going to shift. After my mom's trip, their, their program is going to change. They're going to vet the candidates a bit better and make sure. So you don't get to your mom anymore? No. They want future ministers. They want to mm. invest in people. They don't want to waste their time with kids who organize strikes. Um, <laughs> Uh, my, my, uh, the first thing my mother does in the story is that there's an airplane strike the first days and she's interested in coming here because they also give her pocket money and she's very poor and she thinks she's going to save all her money, not spend a penny and come home and be able to live in France for a couple of months with her, with the daily, um, allowance that they have. And they tell them to take, there's an airplane strike and, um, they ask them to go on buses. They're going to go in, through seven different cities. In, uh, uh, so it's a huge trip. It's visiting factories, um, different universities. They live in families. Uh, and, and they have these uh, chaperones that are with them, who are American students. And in the beginning, when they leave New York, they, uh, have, they were supposed to take an airplane, and there's a strike, so they put them on uh, buses. And I think it's uh, the first city, uh, I don't remember, I think it's Chicago, and I'm not sure now. But anyway, it's it's an 11 hour bus ride, and my mom just refuses. Uh, she says, you promised us airplanes. And if the company is on strike, we're not in the USSR, it's not the national company, just buy us tickets in another company. <laughs> she writes a letter and convinces everybody to start striking until they get what they want. So that's the beginning of the trip. And I found the reports um, at Tulane University in the fantastic Amnistad archive, mm. where the organization and the personal papers of Robinson are there. And my mom always told us these stories and they're sort of, you know, self, um, they're, they're the, the, the myths of her self-invention. Uh, 
she she uh, and I didn't know if they were true. I always doubted. I did another film using archives called Hunt mm. Me Down, where I tell family stories, but using images from French um, and government sources, um, uh, videos, family private home videos, but also government propaganda videos for tourists. And uh, my mother's relationship to reality isn't very precise, but amazingly, all the things she told us about this trip turned out to be true. Um, they were in, in the papers, and the reports are horrible about her um, behavior and wanting to transform the trip into something mm. else to make sure they see that what she thought was the real America. Mm. She wanted to visit factories. She was interested in finding out why um, the race barrier was uh, um, and um, more prevalent, prevalent than um, the class barrier. She wanted to know mm. why the unionization wasn't working in the same way as in Europe. Mm. Um, she didn't understand that uh, some black students that were with her were supporting the government and, mm. and this project. Uh, and then the African kids that were with her, some of them were the sons of future prime minister and president. Mm -hmm. uh, and she was on the other side. So all these strange, you know, displacement or being out of place. Um, and also, mm -hmm. she came here with a pan-African uh, ideology. So for mm -hmm. her, America, the America she came to see is not a far away one. It's a very close right. one. She knows everything that's happening here. Mm -hmm. um, Anyway, and I decided, uh, so my ambition when I do a project, this was an invitation from Performa, for Performa 17, and the curator was Adrian Edwards. And uh, my ambition was to simplify. There was so many mm. stories, storytelling being, um, I, I, I'm mm. sort of reacting, I think, today to the idea that, oh, now you tell the story, this work is so interesting. The idea that it creates or amplify works really bothers me. Mm. Uh, uh, I have this, you know, Groucho mm. Marx reflex that if it becomes very interesting, I need to not be part of the club. Mm -hmm. so I'm trying to simplify as much as possible. I've been failing, but sometimes I, so I chose these stories and shot in 16 millimeter animation um, with the help of Steve Kaufman from this great New York a Brooklyn organization called Mono mm. Nowhere, where they mm. still teach traditional filmmaking. Um, and uh, we just had these, so these are all part of sensorial education tours. Mm -hmm. And they teach you, uh, they teach children how to be in the world, mm -hmm. how to um, use all your senses. And the leaf uh, I used for the riot. Some of them are more sexual, but I didn't choose here where you have the center of the flowers. Mm. Um, and since it was a performance, I, I uh, made some uh, fully sound live mm. when it was played at the Connolly Theater. So the mm. sounds were made live with the film. Oh, that's amazing. Um, can we go to the next image, Tyler? Because I think it gives a kind of a very secretive uh, intro to the, was, this is from Performa, right? That's Montessori grammar. Uh, when you mm. learn Montessori grammar, it's a noun. So it's, it's tree identification for beginners. Um, mm. This is the curtain that I made for the, mm. this is in Basel, but the curtain made for the performance. Mm. Because during the invitation, I tried to escape the live performance. So, <laughs> You know, I gave a tree identification walk with a, mm. with, um, with a specialist. I made a curtain mm. um, with a, a group of um, collaborators, hand-dyed, mm. giant curtain. And every time I thought, you know, done. I'm not going to have to do anything now. <laughs> <laughs> and until the last day, uh, um, Rosalie and, and Adrian knew how to, because what they're interested in, and I think that was also very interesting, is they tried to attract people who don't have that experience. Mm -hmm. Once you taste it, it's quite um, terrifying and, and mm. quite an essential moment of that mm. piece. Um, and the curtain is made for the theater. Mm. There was something in what you were saying, kind of like, refusing this notion of like, oh, 
that story is very interesting. Like, we don't know what this means, but it's like interesting. I thought it was really fascinating. I was looking at the kind of the trajectory of how I was telling you I'm reading all the reviews and you were like, yeah, see, there's a lot of bad ones. I was like, don't worry. I'm an art writer. I write bad ones. Like I'm, I'm, I'm used to bad ones. But there's something specific that happens where it's like in your very early work from like early 2000s, people are kind of just talking about Tangier in that moment. It's about like the contemporary trauma, right? It's like, oh, migration is hard, but it's kind of like stays away. And there's a moment in more recent times where people use the word colonialism often, but it kind of still falls flat or doesn't get complicated. I was really moved by how honest and complicated your mom's story like it felt like a familiar story that made a lot of sense about what it meant to be someone who was asking political questions in that moment and kind of following them or her her ways of revolting in her way um i'm still really interested in your relationship with language and then montessori schools or like unlearning or different mode of learning, especially when we're talking about these other cultures. I don't know, I'm into it. I don't know where it's gonna take me, but I'm into it. Can we go to the next image? So then this is, this is early, before Performa, right? Yeah, that's part of the dinosaur project. Dinosaur the, dinosaur so road. I was interested in how you came to this project because there was a moment where you were like, I'm tired of being boxed in this relationship with like what's happening in Morocco right now. So I'm gonna look for dinosaurs. I'm gonna look for that old thing. And there's this, uh, there was a while when you were like, I was looking for bones, like dinosaur bones is what I'm going for. But there, I found this quote of yours that for me was really on point it said, dinosaurs and fossils are fascinating to me because they involve fiction, forgery, tourism and economy. Um, so these were, uh, these educational posters you found in, a in a museum in Azilal? Yeah. yeah. This is one of those moments where I'm like, I'm doing a Miss Farsi pronunciation of an Arabic thing in an English yeah. way. Yeah. All yeah. the languages. Um, but you came upon these, um, posters that were made to be part of this museum that no longer was functioning. And still they wouldn't let you take the object because they belong to the government. But it's also interesting because for me, these feel like your starting point to really think about the language of abstraction or how it's coded or colors, colors and how it's coded. Um, Tyler, we can kind of go through these and I'll tell you when you're going too far. Um, so yeah, can you tell us a bit about your relationship with dinosaurs and forgery? So the the initial impulse for this project was to take some distance with contemporary history. Um, working at the Cinematheque full time um, uh, in Tangier, I left in 2012. Mm -hmm. um, I'm still on the board, but I don't run the day-to-day -day operations. Uh, it's a new team um, and uh, I was interested in taking some distance and by accident I found out that we had dinosaurs in Morocco. Some fossils were for sale. One big dinosaur was for sale at an auction house in Paris. And um, so, the, and the next day the French press, um, some paleontologists were protesting saying Moroccan dinosaurs are not sure. Um, they're full of forgery. And I didn't understand at that time mm. what it meant. And I, but the percentage of um, bones of fossils to the, the proportions of remade in, in pasture and the proportion of what was really found is mm. usually not the exact balance. So again, the idea of authenticity is something that you know uh, has a huge spectrum. But there was a doubt about something authentic from Morocco, and I thought that was, um, for me, it was, so it smells, right? <laughs> smells, I need to jump <laughs> to something. Um, uh, Tyler, can we go to the next one? We'll come back to this. So then these are from- These are, re these are um, 
preparators. So again, the, the preparation in Morocco, the forgers, there are forgers, and, but there are also preparators who, it, it's the, the, the intense, it's an intense labor. Uh, most of the fossil digging and um, uh, there's, there's real fossil, but there's also a tourist economy with easier made copies. And mm -hmm. most of the people involved in the business were farmers. Uh, who have no land and because of the drought, ha drought mm. uh, successive years of no rain have lost their crops and have turned into this industry just because uh, it was. Um, this is one of the uh, polishing. He's wearing a mask. Mm -hmm. The scene in my film is a very important scene because it seems like the dust that enters their lung is incredible. Uh, mm. it's, 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 a, it's quite a terrible industry. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. And most of what they do is they have to find the stones, but they have to um, make them sellable. So you have to mm -hmm. extract and prepare the fossils to make them visible. It's embellishment. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's not for scientific study. It's mainly for mm -hmm. collectors who want to mm -hmm. sell their homes today. Mm -hmm. uh, the scientific expeditions is a different subject, but it's, o it's also atrocious. Most of the big dinosaurs from Morocco are in American universities and in mm -hmm. Um, other and in Europe, um, mm. we don't have the means to dig, so uh, we don't even have the museum. It's been in project yeah. for years, uh, mm. and so the people who make the fantastic, the Indiana Jones, um, they talk about Sarah No and the other paleontologists who come to Morocco. They make these extraordinary discoveries. They have Moroccan mm. colleagues working with them. One was a woman, and I made a a dinosaur mobile of the one she discovered. She's now a pharmacist that abandoned that job <laughs> because she had no, um, um, she couldn't work as a paleontologist anymore, mm. um, couldn't make a living. Um, mm. in her and so uh, the, the specimens are taken to be studied and mm -hmm. they stay, they're supposed to be borrowed and come back, but they do, no. usually don't come back and we don't yeah. have the means to make replicas which is usually mm. the traditional thing you would do. Mm. Anyway, I discovered this whole history and also I discovered that in our own popular culture, the dinosaur was completely abandoned, mm -hmm. absent. Mm. Uh, you don't have it at the yeah. airport. Um, you mm -hmm. know, the big eating, meat eating dinosaur, the Carcharodontosaurus or the Atlasaurus mm. uh, or the Tazudasaurus. They're not part mm. of what the kids know. Um, yeah. mm. And I thought that was interesting in a country where our, you know, our self, uh, of, of our, um, you would expect them to see them in the airport or on every kid's notebook, but that did not exist. So I decided to do uh, hmm. a trip around uh, the road and I hmm. found out that most of the excavation places had to do, were linked to the history, colonial history of digging. It's when you're hmm. building a dam, that's where you find the dinosaurs. Right. Um, it's when mm. you're building a new road or you're doing phosphate exploitation because you're in right. the, the mines. So that parallel is also very mm. interesting in the project. Tyler, let's keep going back. We're going to pause here for a second. No, I have like a million more questions here and I will try to calm them down. But, um, you know, there's, there's something I found really moving about this moment because... I think I've had moments where people are like, oh, your work is very political. But I'm like, I don't know what you mean by that. Because I'm making the work that is like in New York. And I don't know. It's like, is it about the contemporary politics in Iran and what's happening? Or this constant, if, if you relate it to history, then, then it's too complicated. Or who gets to the, tell this history? Um, but there was a moment, I think it was from your interview with The Rail, but you were saying that, you thought you were leaving all this and like looking for your dinosaur bones. And then you had a conversation with your dad who talked about how this space was like in this moment where he had to forge his own identity because of being a political person that was kind of trying to hide, but also how he was looking for your grandfather's bones that like they couldn't find. So this kind of a lineage and then this fiction of like this ancient land and your relationship to it even though it's all about like the tourists I was also really taken because in this moment you were talking about the like the fake guides I'm curious about the like because you talk about the people give got like give tours for tourists like in a city like Tangier 
and they move them through the city and then the city is what it is but the fakeness there where it's like the narrative that is designed for the visitors um can we go one more back okay and then the bees, other I say a word about bees of course of course bees yeah. were there they were they were in the trash of the museum and they were probably used to explain you know the tectonic plate uh, they were used as the minister of mines and energy uh, as I think a didactic, didactic exhibition um, because I saw some pictures later of mm. uh, Atlasaurus dinosaur being mounted with bees in the back. I found this in a book. Mm. Uh, so they were in the trash. I tried to take them with me and uh, even though they were in the trash, they were huge. Mm. Uh, the guard of the the museum, there's a project of a small museum in Azilal, in the Atlas, and it hasn't, it, it's not finished, like many, sometimes a project, because the finances have um, dried out. Uh, and I just remembered I was a photographer when they told me you can't take them. I said, okay, <laughs> so I photographed <laughs> one by one. So the project has some film and photographs and objects and fake fossils that I brought back and real fossils mm -hmm. and invented, you know, mobiles. But the show mm -hmm. was called Fake Guide. Um, because as I was teaching myself about the history of the geology um, mm -hmm. and the uh, um, different readings of the landscape that you can have, there's a moment, I never really did the film. I did a short film. I had a project for a longer film mm -hmm. that I never finished. I never even started. But in the film, there's this magnificent scene that I filmed, but it doesn't exist in, in any film yet, where I asked different um, characters uh, that I meet and some were with me in the expedition. Um, mm -hmm. So a sociologist, a paleontologist and a geologist to read the landscape. And mm -hmm. the paleontologist just mm -hmm. talks and hunt, for him, everything is underwater. And he gives us exactly like in the image you see now, he gives us the different layers and he's interpreting what you see on the surface being mm. something that came from down to the surface. And then the sociologist gives us uh, a reading of the landscape that is Berber words for the body of a woman. So it's the shoulder, mm. if I remember, the, mm. all the surfaces are female members, mm. uh, female mm. pieces of the body. Then we have a farmer uh, who's a shepherd and we ask him mm. and he gives us an ad administrative decoupage. Does that make sense? He tells us this is part of this city and this mm. is the border where the police can come mm -hmm. and you're allowed to cross. Mm. And that for me was one of the most interesting. Um, mm. I felt that I was literate and that's something I, mm. I was visually illiterate in reading mm -hmm. that kind of landscape. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting because for me, there was a moving point. I think it was like an interview, like a very early interview. And you were talking about the Straits Project. And you talked about like illiteracy in Morocco and how important it is like socially to move forward. But then I think this is the point where you talk about your own visual illiteracy, which for me, like really changed how we can think about our relationship to language, but also because this is the time, if we can go to the next one, Tyler, the next one. So these are your project after Frank Stella. And there's something really, for me, very fascinating about this echo you have with like, what it means to be in conversation with Frank Stella, who was being inspired by Morocco in that moment. There's this like, this weird echo happening, like you trying to be a contemporary artist, having a conversation with this land, and then there's all these layers of back and forth. And that was like, I think this is a moment where you start talking about the language of different colors and dyeing, like in Morocco. Um, and you start exploring dyeing fabrics. Um, I don't know, the way you said, how do we read the landscape for me was really moving, because it summed up a lot of things um from and the kind of characters you have there um any thoughts around this before we go to ajadir please that feels important this is um this is the back this is the first time i show the back oh. of a piece uh, mm -hmm. so this is called tidifni um 
I don't know really about Frank Stella's influence, his Moroccan influence. I read it somewhere. I don't really care. It's, it's part of the, and I wouldn't call it a conversation with him. Um, mm. uh, as far as I'm concerned, I read that, I saw one of his pieces using, um, you know, very bright paint in, in the mm. 60s after he did a trip. And he gave the name of Moroccan cities to his a few mm -hmm. paintings. And I was learning how to um, dye, and I had tons of textiles. And the question uh, was recurrent of, what are you going to do with all this? I, I was interested in dyeing. And so <laughs> more uh, than, than doing something with the dyes, I'm mm -hmm. interested in learning how to make color, period. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But to stop having question asked, I started making stripes. Stripes are easy. Um, and I found, and I started doing, you know, Rabat, like a deer. Um, mm -hmm. He didn't do many of the cities I invented. This one is inspired by CBP, which was a, one of the last Spanish colonial cities. We still mm -hmm. have Ceuta and Melilla. He didn't do Tangier, which is too bad because it's the nicest one. <laughs> so I had to invent the Tangier, right? Mm. Um, uh, mm. And also in Tangier, the, the Jbella, the farmers who are uh, who come once a week to the marketplace and who are quite um, whose culture is quite endangered by all mm -hmm. the horrid homogenization you know with all the supermarkets they the farmers market on Thursdays and Sunday are with these women that carry a, 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 um, a striped red and white um, piece mm -hmm. of fabric handwoven fabric that they wear on their waist mm -hmm. so the red and white for me was also very much uh, of mm. my hometown. Mm. So it was something of an appropriation of a reappropriation mm. um, in, a, mm. in, a, in a light way. Um, <laughs> what I was celebrating is being self-taught mm. uh, and that's usually what's the center that I'm interested in um, with all its imperfection. Mm. I'm, I'm a terrible dyer and, and, and uh, with all due respect to quilters and people who do really nice work, I, uh, <laughs> even though this is beautifully made, I'm also interested in, in, um, in mm. it very much leaving the imperfection and the traces of uh, mm. the genealogy of the pieces made as you learn. Mm. I like the sentence, the sentence of like, I'm celebrating being self-taught. This is a nerdy side question. You've been doing the natural dyes in different locations, right? Does it feel completely different? Do you get different results or is it always different? It's always different. Oh. When you grow your own plants, it's very different. Mm. Are you? And when you go to, you know, and, and then you meet other dyers and some are very, um, uh, very much into precision mm. and, um, you know, they follow 18th century manuals. Mm. Master dyers, and then there's some who are more into the experience of being a group of women together, and it's mm. static and happy. It's a it's a really happy place. It's a very mm. hard thing, but if you can do it, also, and and I know some dyers are pissed off that people take a workshop and then call themselves. Dyers. <laughs> there's a huge protest from the great master Abu Bakr mm. Sultana, who was complaining that it took him, you know, half his life <laughs> to call himself a dyer. He's in Mali. Mm. Uh, and he was trained in Japan mm. um, and um, okay am I back no, it's so a very very difficult job yeah okay everything paused for a second I think that angry dire control those. Uh, can people hear me? Is everything? What happened? Okay, everyone's back. I think Zoom is censoring you, Yito. I think they're with the real dyers. <laughs> uh, it got caught for a moment. Uh, Tyler, can we... Diggers and dyers. Diggers and dyers. I must say, as a foreigner, I like the word dyers. There's something really intense to it. Um, well, there's, okay. there's something wonderful in English to say, excuse me, I have to go die. I'm busy and dying. I mean, I, you know, you can't escape. I love it. 
dying magic. <laughs> the dye oh, garden. Um, yeah. 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 Dye garden. There's something. Really, um, I appreciate this moment of us. Uh, yeah. It's yeah. So, collages. so, yeah. Um, you already mentioned this before. And of course, it, it was in my mind. Um, but so I'm going to do a brief intro yeah. to your Ag Agadir, Agadir project. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I want to say Ajadir. I'm, I'm making up words now. Uh, Iranians do it. Um, so th in this project, and um, the way I was introduced to it was your exhibition at The Curve in London. Uh, and it had multiple different parts, but you focus on this earthquake uh, that happens in uh, Agadir in 1960, which is four years after the independence. And it's a devastating um, earthquake. I think a third of the uh, city's population dies. Um, and then after that, the city is rebuilt uh, with this like brutalist architecture. And you were kind of interested in that conversation with the space you were exhibiting. But what I find most moving about this project. I mean, I thought it was interesting. I was looking at a lot of text around it and sometimes people are like, there's this narrative of like progress, like catastrophe happened and then I'm like, no, it feels much more complicated. It's like it, the catastrophe feels like an in-between moment to pause. Um, you found inspiration uh, from the book you mentioned earlier by Mohammed Khaider Din. Um, I didn't know the text is up now in English and now I can access it. Um, but, and I really love how you often introduce his text. He uh, wrote this book that talks about this catastrophe and the way you put it is, the book was written by a bureaucrat sent to do a report on the city who doesn't do the, what the commission asks <laughs> him to do. He comes back with a poem novel. And sometimes you mention the different characters. There's the king. There's a unionist, there's a cook, a peasant, a billy goat, um, and a female Berber warrior. Tahina. Tahina, is that the name? Um, so you, and then you have these, um, this, the exhibition has many parts. Um, one of the parts are the collages we are looking at and somewhere you were discussing that uh, here you thought a lot about what it means to talk about this moment. Um, and it felt most, what made sense was to use the language of collage with images that would exist, like kind of this coming together. And you have a video that goes along this work um, where it's uh, different interviews people did about the catastrophe, but you take the word, like the mention of the earthquake out, but also in this time you're really interested, I don't know what the English term is for it, but like sounds like you always do it. I will try to do it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you always do it. But like, what is beyond the language to express this moment of catastrophe? Well, there's a uh, moment in the film where, where a man yeah. says, describing the, the, the moving, he says, <laughs> this is how it felt. And he has no words yeah. um, to describe then, how he felt. Yeah. And then you have performers that perform Khairuddin text, uh, like parts of it. Mm -hmm. um, parts we could but, translate until now, you, the full translation yeah. is available. But something that for me was really, um, what I was really taken by in this work, I mean, it's weird and like hard and important that you already mentioned the explosion in Beirut um, and this sense of once again, a catastrophe that echoes a past and fears about a future and like real concerns. And I've been, I constantly think about different fears in Beirut and how hard it is to discuss what's happening without simplifying it, um, to talk about the frustration about like the corruption and the failure of the government, these questions about the future, and then really facing the catastrophe. Um, Oh, this will be my last part of my ramble about uh, this, and then I want to hear your thoughts on it. At this time, you discussed that you were collecting information about whistles. I would love to hear more about whistles, too. Um, yeah, I was also interested in the oral tradition in North Africa and the Middle East, and how do we, what does it mean to make work that tries to be in conversation with that? I will leave that aside because you're giving me a look being like, yeah, see. 
That's a lot. <laughs> That's a lot. Okay, I'll step back. You give me um, thought. I'll start backwards or I'll forget. Yeah. Uh, can I say a word about what we're looking at first? Yeah, of course. Um, those are collages made from Keystone press photographs that I had from the Agadir. Um, so they're, they're, they're news, uh, news grams. I don't know what you call them. The text is, you know, 3.53, huge earthquake in the mm. um, Miami of Morocco. Then mm. two hours later, the telegram says, uh, 50 people and then it's two thirds mm. of the city and then it's the whole old city and then evacuation they evacuate the French mm. so there's a big French population mm. and then what you see in this image right here is the DDT they're afraid of cholera so they spray with the most toxic um, mm. they spray the whole city with DDT people are in camps uh, and that's when Ferdin with a commission is going to be sent um, mm. because he worked for the government to do a report on the condition of this, of this uh, small city. Um, so I use two things. There's, these are gouaches that are, it's a collection of gouache that I had. I used something that I couldn't even frame as too precious, of mm. gouache from the 20s and 30s. I think they're modeled mm. for house wallpaper. Um, and the photograph, the press photographs that I bought. So you have the photo of the event, and in the back you have the caption, which is like the telegraph, and I collapsed them together. Um, the earthquake happened <clears throat> at 11 p.m. Most people are in their pajamas, and most people ended up being in the streets, or their house fell, and mm. they were in the streets in their, in their pajamas, and they were in the safe place of their bedrooms or in their house and that's what the wall collapsed of the idea of the domestic space being not safe anymore mm. um is something that comes back in the stories that are told um mm. and the stories that are collected in the film you saw which is a newsreel um where uh, different witnesses maybe mostly french um because those are the ones who are saved right away and sent to france to mm. um there's also no commemoration of this Agadir uh, nationally. It's the biggest mm. earthquake we had in history. And it, there's no, you know, there's no minute of silence. There's no history mm. of it that is told mm. in schools. Um, there was also a very uh, loud silence around this event. Mm. Um, in Agadir, in the book, Khair Din, what I was interested in is that Khair Din uses this disaster to discuss in, with all the characters that he um, convoc that he uh, calls in his book that he invites um, to discuss the disaster that he wants to discuss is colonialism mm. and it stays very ambiguous and the questions that he asks or as the unionists discussing with a 12th century king um, mm. uh, uh, discussing with a cook and a madman, mm -hmm. all these conversations that happen are mainly to ask, how do we build after? How do we rebuild? Do we rebuild exactly the way it was? Do we reinvent the society? Do we get rid of everything to start from scratch? What, mm -hmm. what are we supposed to keep? What is worth mm -hmm. keeping? Mm -hmm. um, what makes sense to redo? Uh, and in the construction of Agadir, the, the, the way the architects are going to rethink the modern city, they're also they're in this Berber brutal, brutalism that is having a big moment now mm. of uh, interest. M most of the walls um, of the exhibition I did in the, uh, at the Barbican is I did big scratch drawings, you know, with mm -hmm. this black kind of paint, like kids drawing where you scratch off. And I reproduced many of the public buildings mm. um, that were rebuilt. Brutalism is an architecture that gives a lot of um, comfort, you know, because yeah. it's heavy, it's safe. <laughs> it's usually <laughs> after the war building. Mm. Uh, um, Somewhere you mentioned, you were, I think, around this project said, I was trying to understand the brutalist architecture, so I created a grammar for it. That's how I always I, think I about those drawings. Well, yeah. I asked architects to deconstruct it for me so I would understand mm. what made it 
what was the grammar and that part of the drawings we put on the wall. Mm. We had all the, um, the piliers, the auvent, I don't know them in English, mm. unfortunately, but the, the grammar of, uh, mm. of what modernist architecture, um, the transparency of the walls, you know, bricks with holes that light go through. It's quite massive, but with recurrent um, shapes and forms. And as I was learning, I used it on the drawings on the wall. And on the mm. other side, you have these very small collages uh, um, that are a mix of gouache and, and, and found photographs, found gouache and found photographs. And then across the street from the Barbican Art Center, you have mm. the drama school. So for me, it was fantastic to have students come um, and try to embody um, mm -hmm. in pajama mm. this hallway. The Barbican space is a strange space in the back of a theater um, mm. using furniture that I made, uh, very mm. strange um, furniture mm. where you're back to back or mm. side to side, eavesdropping furniture. Mm. Uh, uh, Tyler, can we go back and kind of still move through the collages? Um, you were mentioning... And they were declaiming the text. We had a small mm. portion of the text translated by Pierre Zori, who mm. translated Khadim before, but hadn't translated as a dear. And mm -hmm. we chose... To, the book is hard to read. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's all different kinds of styles. Um, it's... Uh, it's it's voracious, it's savoureux, it's, it's, it's so many different things. But we chose a few pieces um, mm. and had the, the um, young actors uh, impersonate uh, and they mm. did it in a beautiful way and they would come mm. once um, a day on Saturdays and twice a week and mm. occupy the space with their bodies. And that I think was um, mm. very important in, in mm and the relationship to the disaster, that, mm. there, were, that there was these voices singing, mm. making mm. noises. And you asked me about mm. the girl mm -hmm. in this film. Mm -hmm. Also, because I was dealing with so many dead bodies in the mm. project, I felt that there was, that I couldn't touch the footage too much of the film. So I decided to do a film without adding any images. I would just multiply the existing images, slow of all, mm -hmm. elongate an eye. Mm -hmm. um, and I use a voice like the lettriste would do, like Isidore Rosu would do in film, to create this poetry of a sort of grinding mm -hmm. sound, groaning, you know, something more mm -hmm. primal, primal mm -hmm. uh, to be closer mm -hmm. to the impossibility to say mm -hmm. that one mm -hmm. character in the film. Mm. One of the only um, Moroccan characters. Oh, that's true. Right. Right. I use that. Mm. So I would I would play with mm. the sound. So most of the sounds in the film are just backward, replayed. You mm. know, I played on the rhythm and transformed the existing material, and that's a rule I gave myself. Mm. Um, and that's the dancer that you have here. This is a dye filter. Mm that I stuck, which has nothing to do with the project, but I made a little dancer and it has no mm. That's the beginning of the dance macabre. Mm. You know, there's something about, there was a moment talking about Khairuddin's text. You mentioned that it's hard to read. And perhaps one of the things that I'm really drawn to in your work is that you don't shy away from like, you don't simplify. And there's a moment where, you were mentioning uh, about those sculptures that are made out of the furniture, uh, that at that moment you were interested in this collection of dreams and um, these nightmares um, that someone had collected that was about um, like house objects attacking you, like becoming figures and attacking you. And this person was specifically talking about the World War II in Europe, which is also, related to the history of uh, the curve. But sometimes I wonder, I wonder why it's so hard to explain um, what happens, at least in my case, in the Middle East and North Africa and like the trauma of it with the same complexity that it can be hard to read, 
that it can be hard to imagine and you have to kind of stay with that part that doesn't allow the language or how this Moroccan figure in the film doesn't have words. Uh, I'm still really taken by the image of the domestic objects um, as a nightmare, as, as mm -hmm. what can tack. Um, it, it's not the clean story of like post-colonial narratives I think we would like to hear, but I think it's much closer to the paradoxical, complicated creatures that they be became. Um, can we move forward? Because I interior, need to- Can I say yeah. something about yeah, the, of course. the interior of the room, the interior of your bedroom being a threat mm -hmm. uh, uh, where you can't even hide from uh, and the, 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 the domestic object being a threat is also about um, police surveillance when mm -hmm. your neighbors, you know, mm -hmm. it's Eastern Europe, but it's also <laughs> Um, when your neighbors can tell on you, uh, when the mm -hmm. closest, uh, it has to do also with civil war, when the closest neighbor can be thinking something else right. um, mm -hmm. uh, and be on the other side and you can't tell and, uh, and not, being, not feeling safe in the places where you're supposed to feel safe. Mm -hmm. And uh, Khardin is not hard to read. It's, you can, it's hard to read the whole through as right. you, you want to do it. <laughs> In one sitting, it's <laughs> exhausting, but it, it's exhilarating, and there's mm -hmm. you, you can do it, come in and out. Um, that's how I did it, and, and mm. vocabulary sometimes is <laughs> need a dictionary. I mean, he loves mm. new words, uh, um, mm. but I'm taken. Words. But the, the the domestic house, the, mm. the, the the your house falling on you and being the unsafe place. I think today the first image that I think of is. Um, uh, Palestinian collective punishment. There's houses in, mm. in, in the Palestinian territories, and especially now mm. since the bombing in Gaza has just uh, been suspended, uh, of houses being destroyed uh, mm. or having people, having um, men destroy their own house uh, mm. so they don't pay uh, for the government to come and destroy mm. the house, and having um, mm. the Palestinian workers build the settlements that are on the territory on their territory. I mean, this domestic space yeah. uh, and personal space that's constantly inv invaded, right. I think, has to do with um, colonial history. Right. Uh, 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 and mm. this, um, yeah, and that's the closest parallel that I see today and the mm. one you can see every day in yeah. the news of mm. you know, the white paper. Yeah, and that makes me think about how. Yeah, sometimes I wonder if like the word post is right. I feel like post-colonialism gives this idea that it can be over and then there's a different part that has like resolved everything that ha happened. I feel like there's much more about like, you know, like a continuous shaking. Um, um, I don't think we're, we're, we're we, ha we still have two Spanish city in Morocco, I go see the word. <laughs> the other day I was talking to a friend, I was like, is neocolonialism already happening? And they were like, what do you mean, Yassi? It has been happening. Latin American friend. I was like this kind of a back and forth. Um, can we go to the next project? Uh, and this will be whatever you call it. I think we're still in it. Uh, yeah, yeah. We're learning how to decolonize. But Khairdin and it, the resonance of his words. If you can read it in English uh, mm. or in the French uh, original text, if that's what he wrote, mm. in, um, you'll see the fantastic visionary. Mm. And the wit, I mean, he's extremely funny. Um, mm. uh, this is a different project. Um, yeah, this was a total mystery to me. Uh, it's two things. I use this wallpaper, which is not meant to be wallpaper. This is the paper that you're probably familiar with. If you, do you know this crystal paper with colors that you find at the dry clean in some cities in the world, in Morocco and Syria? Mm. And some, you know, they have they have it on the table, and it has different yeah. colors, and it cracks. Mm. Well, this paper is used to dry textile in the fast textile mm. industry, mm. and it's recycled in markets to wrap stuff. Mm. I use it as wallpaper. I buy it by the kilo. <laughs> I'm also interested in the circulation of clothes and the thrift industry. That's what I'll be mm. working on next, mm. um, and its relationship to Africa as the dumping place. Mm. Um, Mm. Uh, and its influence on fashion and, and the way we carry our bodies. But in, in this instance, 
the wallpaper is this recycled paper. Uh, but when you buy a roll, you don't know what the color is. You have one pattern and then the pattern disappears and then there's another pattern and another pattern. So I covered the walls. And these photograms that you see are made of, it's an, it's an homage to a um, Portuguese artist um, I love called Lourdes Castro. Mm. She lives on the island of Madeira. And she did a lot of, when she was in exile in France um, with her um, husband, she did a, a, for a magazine, she did a few candy wrapping collages and I did photograms of candy. Mm. Um, I mm. uh, forgot my negatives at the dark room one day and all I had was candy. <laughs> <and> <laughs> so I decided to be a conscientious uh, worker and to do my dark room time. Um, <laughs> in this great place that I, uh, where there's a gang lab in, uh, in uh, New York called My Own Color Lab. I love them. Me too. <laughs> right. All of them, Cooper, right. yes. So yeah. Yeah, they, they, they allowed me to, to do this uh, because I had, I had nothing with me. And so I said, oh. <laughs> and they take you seriously. And yeah. so this became a very important series for me, um, mm. experimenting with candy. Um, it was interesting, I received your images, and this one was called Bonbon. So then I was like, oh, I have some candy gift that is kind of a mystery to me. Uh, can we move to the next one? And I'm gonna slowly open to the, uh, for Q and A, cause I'm gonna make sure I make time for everyone. So these are parts of uh, your latest- the Power of Two Free Sons. Which is related it's to- The film that I just started. I made a and it's in Tangier, like it was inspired, there's a Tangier, Virginia. And it's the work in yeah, Governor's Island? Yeah, that's part of the show that I had at Governor's Island. Um, but this, the, the, the show had work on Tangier, Virginia, Tangier Island, and its specificities, and mm. the, its disappearing island. Um, and this film is uh, shot in Chicago, mm. in, a, a, in a place where you can see the, you can see time pass on fabric um, to test the durability of, you know, yogurt packaging and milk mm -hmm. packaging and tents and clothes and fabric, you send your samples to a company. And this company can imitate the power of two or three cents. That's mm -hmm. what the film is called. It's, uh, accelerated, it's accelerated weathering and the machine mm -hmm. looks like a, you know, Brian Geisen dream machine. Mm -hmm. So in 16 millimeter, um, to represent the 20 years that Tangier Island has to live. I brought my own samples. These are mine. Mm. Uh, they're just, they're not even hand dyes. You know, they're just pieces of um, quilting fabric. Mm. And, um, and I filled the functioning of the machine. And it's a, mm. it's a project that's ongoing. I did a short film that you can see now at the yeah. time you. Wait, we had more images. Um... I think we lost Tyler. I'm sure they're going to be back. Um, yeah, Tyler, just uh, their laptop just lost power. Okay. So we're okay. going we're gonna to get the okay. screen back okay. now. Great. Um, so before, and then when we come back, we can uh, go through it. Um, but I would love to hear about your collaboration with Bettina in that project and the idea of her as a character that like Is lost her. Okay, thank you. And um, Catherine, can we go to the next couple of images? Next image. And the film, yeah. Yeah. And then if that's we look at the lab. next image. Oops. That's the lab. That's the that's machine. The machine it's where so your samples intense. go. One of the machines, because there are many, many. And this machine was invented in 1932. Not this specimen, but the principle yeah. of accelerated weathering. I thought um, it really feels like a sci-fi film. Like futurism. I'm yeah, like, I'm doing Seriously. something. I don't know what I'm doing, so I did uh, a two-minute film. But <laughs> I can we <laughs> look at the next image? Yeah, the machine that ages things. It's also very mesmerizing. Um, okay, I think we should start for Q and A. So before I leave you, if you can go, um, Catherine, can we move through the images? Nice. 
can you show Bettina? Oh, that's Bettina. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So we have some Bettina, if you want to introduce Bettina that work. Doctor. Yeah. Uh, I, in the last year or so, two years, I've been working on um, showing and sharing the work of an artist uh, who's turning 93 at the end of this month. Knocked on wood. Uh, Bettina Grossman lives at the Chelsea Hotel. Uh, her work is not very well known. We already had three shows together, two in Hamburg and one in New York. Mm. And I'm working on a monograph uh, mm -hmm. with Grégory Hubert, with a, with a designer, um, to show her work and, and hopefully get more and more people introduced mm -hmm. to the amazing things she did in her bedroom studio, mm. uh, where she still lives in the last 30 yeah. years. Can we go through the images, Catherine? Yes. Um, but there was... There was something really moving about, because if I understand the story right, at one point, Bettina lost her whole studio to a fire, yeah. and she travels to Europe for a couple of years, and then comes back, and since then has been living in Chelsea Hotel. That's her portfolio, yes. And, and I think there's something deep about her relationship with displacement, and like what it means to live in a hotel, and the sense of playfulness. Like, how she plays with patterns and like these games and questions and thoughts that really relates to your work. I'm also dying to see the books. Um, I must say, yeah, being these are her impeccable portfolios. Oh. Um, there's oh. about you know 20 of them where mm. she rephotographs the work. She makes sculptures. She photographs. The, the photography mm. is very important, mm. and the photography will create an abstraction that she will reuse as a sculpture. Mm. There's a sort of circular. And her isolation, because mm -hmm. very rare are the people who were able to see the mm -hmm. things she makes. Mm -hmm. uh, that's her. <laughs> that's her studio. Um, and then, Catherine, can we go to the one more? Yeah, the cover. And okay. The work that I did thinking about Bettina. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so in uh, the show that I had at the LMCC, curated by Omar Barada, um, on Governor's Island, uh, at the last minute, I, I didn't feel very comfortable in talking about Governor uh, Tangier Island in mm -hmm. Virginia. Uh, uh, they were thinking mm. um, most of them are Trump voters. Uh, they're having a really hard time in that small disappearing island. The culture mm. and the dialect is very interesting there. But I didn't spend enough time, so I, I suggested that I would change the, the, the subject of the exhibition. Mm -hmm. I only said that a month before by putting Bettina in the center of the show and mm -hmm. by making works in dialogue with her. Since mm -hmm. I was working on her work and looking for a place, mm -hmm. her dream show is to show at the Skyscraper Museum in New York. If the mm -hmm. director of the Skyscraper Museum hears me, um, <laughs> I think it's Bettina's lifetime dream is to have a show there. So I wish I could organize that. Mm. And I found these uh, papers. Um, you can see very small dots. They're photographs. Mm -hmm. They're photographs of um, papers with holes in them. And they're mm -hmm. sewing lessons from uh, my mom's center, the center mm. that she runs, where one of the first classes is to learn how to make straight. Mm. In the Froebel, you know, kindergarten tradition of the mm -hmm. Froebel gift, they have to do straight lines on a sheet of paper with a sewing machine and no thread. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so each student does what he can, and then they end up in the trash. Mm. I picked up the papers full of holes, and I printed them. Mm. And this is it also, know. it really reminds me of that very early work of your grandmother's cookbooks and phone books and the way she used lines as a language. Um, so I'm going to, I found this like somewhere you were discussing how you're interested in the language around these different structures that you kind of like self teach. And I think the sense, the sentence was Muslims are made by walking. And I'm still really taken by this sentence and kind of taking it out of context, but by you relating to this sentence. So I want to leave you with muslins are made by walking. And can we look at the last image? What is that? And I, oh. I think this can be our way of opening for q &A. It was for the anniversary of uh, mm. 2016. It took me a long time to finish it. <laughs> to <laughs> find the right letter press font. 
so good. Uh, yesterday I found some like someone's Instagram that was Shakespeare. So it's taking over. I think it's a quote by Qaddafi. Whoa. I'm not sure. I think so Whoa. many people said that. Um, I've always heard it and I always wondered why don't you make a, you know, the big question was do you write Sheikh with a C or an S? That's what took a few years. <laughs> Would you change it based on where you show it? No. No. Okay. No, <laughs> the, the, yeah. it, the, 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 the graphism of the two S's. Yeah. Well. So good. Okay, so thank you so much. I think we should open for the Q and A. Catherine, if you want to take over. Um. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Ito and Yasi. This was a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. Um, our first question comes from our poet today, Parisa. Parisa, I will hand you a mic um, now. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, beautiful conversation. Uh, going back to the dyes, I was wondering if there's any kind of relationship between the plants used as dyes and their medicinal properties? Yes, there are. <laughs> and uh, there's, a, there's huge manuals. One of them is called The Art of Dying, one of my favorites. It's an Italian book uh, that combines many knowledge about the techniques of dying, uh, but also the properties that are um, healing, especially for, for you know indigo or St. John's wort. There's there's a lot of or, or chamomile. There's an encyclopedias. You'll see plants that have the word tinctoria in their Latin name will usually leave a stain, and that's when they were used in recipes for dying. Um, so yeah, there is a historical. Um, parallel, not even parallel, there's a historical uh, uh, um, link between, I'm bothered because I see myself and I couldn't see myself before, I have to keep this back. Most of the plants that have color that were used color were first used um, like indigo for, uh, for uh, disinfection and reason. Look at Herboriste and Psychopedia and the parallel and the information on each one. But if you do a medicinal garden and a dye garden together, it makes total, total sense. Thank you. Um, our next question comes from our very own John Capetta. JC, you should be able to activate your mic. Yeah, I'm here. Um, Ito, thank you so much, Yasi. Thank you. Um, I'm really excited. I, I transcribed a good part of the interview that you did with Osman a few years ago, so it's very cool to hear you speak uh, speak live and in person. Um, my question is my question is about the Cinematheque de Tanger, um, which fascinated me fascinated me years ago when I learned about it. Um, you rescued this space in 2007 and, or 2006, 2007. And I think that in the time since then, at least in the United States, the conversation around like what to do with and how to value those kinds of artistic spaces and community spaces has like really intensified following um, the recession and now this recession, I guess. Um, and I feel like it's kind of a losing battle here. Um, like, there's no cinema in my town, it still exists, but like, it's just barely holding on. It's volunteers, it's leaky ceilings, it's like the whole thing. Um, so my question is, how did, if you think it did, your artistic practice and sensibility inform the way you approached, you approached the project? Um, and I guess I'm, I'm mostly interested in like, what exactly did you feel like was worth saving? Um, and to that point, like, what do you think that the previous owners and kind of the society at large, like missed about that space? Um, that you were able to see and kind of make, kind of bring back? Yes, this is the book. <laughs> we did a whole book to tell the history. It's in five languages of Tangier and the movies, the way people went to the movies, the meaning of the cinema culture in, in uh, 
Tangier in the 50s, 60s, and 70s before we arrived, and what it meant to have a place um, where the whole world was uh, accessible um, in a curated way. For, for us, the Cinematheque was mostly in the beginning, it was a place. It was an experimental place, artist run. Uh, we didn't mean to make an institution out of it. We didn't want to in the beginning. Uh, what mattered is to, was to save on the central square of the city, on the main square of the city, to save one of the last historic cinemas and curate programs of things that were not visible locally, which is the National Cinema. You could see it all over festivals, but you could not see it in your own country. Documentaries, art films, um, and then have a place where people could meet and discuss it. So in the tradition of the film set, uh, even though the satellite dishes made the world accessible, uh, and also the, the pirate films that you could buy on the street. It, but it, there was still a demand for um, haven, I mean, for lovers, students, and that, that was our strong point, the cafe, free Wi-Fi in the beginning. Um, and the kids that came in the first years after we restored the building and started programming it are the ones running it today. So something did work into uh, creating a place where you would meet the filmmakers, meet musician that would play live music on silent film, uh, meet the directors and the producers, and create a place where film was um, a space for a conversation about current events in the country, but also about, you know, Chile, Germany in the 40s, uh, Japan. Because in the film culture available in the country, there was Bollywood, and American cinema, that's it. <laughs> there was no European cinema, no Arabic films anymore. That happened in the 70s where you had Egyptian cinema. So we sort of re, uh, reinvented Tangier as an international city uh, through film. And uh, the film club was, I think, the essential thing that worked in that space. Um, you asked me what was worth saving. Um, I think a, a spirit of openness. Uh, Tangier in the 90s, when we start thinking about saving that place, is a place that uh, has a lot of people leaving it, still has. It's the jumping off place of Africa. All the kids want to leave. Uh, and I was in this peculiar situation where with a group of friends, I was going back from Europe to Morocco to work on a project to um, help create a space that would make Tangier um, cultural offer interesting. And, and the idea that we had right away is it wasn't, um, uh, it wasn't a, our goal wasn't to occupy the kids and keep them busy, you know, it, it, which is the way the government sometimes or the city officials would think. Uh, our idea was right away to create a space for critical thinking, for circulation of ideas, to invite people to come and stay. So the, the movie in Contraband was the pretext to do many other things that happened in that cinema over the next, last, next uh, 14 years now. Oof. And I had a previous experience of well, 15 years of working with the Arab Image Foundation which is another archive in Beirut, um, which was looking at quite damaged uh, in the last document. So that also led to this, the fact that uh, we collected um, and created a history that was missing in photography and we worked on that in film and culture, creating our first collection. Thank you so much. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, our third question comes from Malvika. Malvika, you should be able to activate your mic. Hi. Um, 
Uh, I just wanted to say thank you for uh, coming here to speak. It's been so lovely, especially with this last question, getting to hear you sort of speak on like the film as a a way of inviting the internationalism. Um, and just personally, I feel like one of the things I regret or long for most is like this era where there were, where the regional alliance, where the pan-Arab, the pan-African, the cross-national solidarities was like a real mode of functioning. Um, everywhere. Uh, so that's just really wonderful and heartening to hear. Um, my, my question is, um, I'm really interested in your family history, your personal family history, your family history uh, within the country, your parents, um, perhaps not entirely proper for a talk that is on your work, but even in your work, you've been speaking uh, so poetically about your mother, her leftism, the myths of her self-invention, which um, you realize are true. So I feel a little emboldened to ask maybe, um, sort of, uh, yeah, I'd love to know more about your family. Uh, I had read in passing yesterday that your father was also sort of um, a well-known leftist and in the political opposition to Hassan II. And so it, it seemed to me perhaps you were tied in more way than one to the political history of your country. And I was, I, yeah, I, I was wondering if you would tell us more about your parents. Um, for instance, how did they meet and their political uh, actions? Um, my, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll give you a very short answer. I mean, okay. the best way would ask you if you want to see Hand Me Down, the film I made, because I told many of the ways my parents met in these stories. It's my mom's stories and my dad's stories and one story. That's mine in the, in the sort of the family history. Um, my dad met my mom by hiring her. She looked French, very white, straight black hair, had a bike, and she sold a party newspaper. And so he hired her um, when he was trying to escape Morocco because he was the head of the left, student left. Um, and was condemned to death and had to escape. Uh, and he put her in trouble by doing that. Um, and then they re-met later. Um, my uh, father is a journalist, retired journalist uh, today. And my mother is a psychotherapist, um, social worker, um, because she, she runs a uh, buildings um, that are essential in the fabric of the city of Tangier today. Um, and part of my reason to create the Cinematheque was I wanted to work with her, uh, but not under her, <laughs> and bring my, um, uh, my savoir-faire next to her, and that's how next to a building she took over uh, she has this guerrilla tactic of occupying abandoned buildings in Tangier and then asking and then finding uh, fundraising to restore them. And one of them was a former uh, British police headquarter, abandoned, that was a police center and she turned it into a house of women. And the cinema riff actually, which was going to become Cinematheque, is right next to it. So also in this, Tangier is a big small city where everybody knows everybody. And so I wanted to, I mean, my first clientele in um, creating the cinema were the women from the House of Women who were right behind and the kids for the kids program. And so it was a way to um, think about the question of alienation in the city uh, in a different way and bringing culture um, that was supposedly high culture, very good films with text, with people presenting them. Um, in Moroccan, you say, we don't give ginger to the donkey. Uh, and we did, that's what we did. We gave ginger to the donkey. They deserved it. Thank you for that beautiful answer. Sorry, I was just writing down everything you're saying, um, but thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you, Malika, for that question. Um, so this is when we transition to our daily ritual of ending our lunches with a poem. 
Um, we've carried that tradition into these events. And today I'm thrilled to welcome the poet Parisa Porian to the stage. Uh, Parisa Porian is a painter and poet from Louisiana. She currently teaches in the writing BFA and painting MFA programs at Pratt and is a student of herbalism in upstate New York. Her first chapbook, Birth Dirt, is forthcoming from Gloss Projects. Um, Parisa, I will pass you a mic now. Thank you. Uh, how's the sound? Can you hear me? Great. Um, yeah, thank you so much for inviting me, Brooklyn Rail and Catherine and Yasi and Ito. Beautiful, beautiful conversation. Lots of food for thought. Um, okay, I'm going to read two poems. First one's called In the Evening Schools of Longing. In the evening schools of longing, I wish to rest my head, hug someone with breasts. Children love ugly old grandmothers. Smooth skin, not a set, smooth skin, not a set nest in the kingdom of heaven. I know the squeak note of one of two. The whole is to be outside all day, all night, without my head on your chest or anybody's, just three pillows placed in each hollow, borrowed sounds and borrowed tongue, God-given crickets. What could be more honest than a little scream? The rain comes down mineral laden, the male shock of red, the female cardinal, the color of my birth dirt, my little hands long and large, the birds hold on to windblown wires, every effort now going into getting down, every effort and slow down right now, nodding off of protective rest. Spitting the tongue, it don't fit, it won't fit, is ill-defined, has the wrong clothes, too heavy, too dull, tongue jump ship, afraid of pounding hammer and silver, zinc safety coating on a little bowl of rice. Little cries for mom and dad, the disapproving tut, white tender belly out, acorn clutched. Let's eat a nut, salted and soaked for slow and steady down the hatch. I'm afraid to leave, afraid to pull weeds, lay eggs in a nest beget bodies of terrifying, terrifying eyes. Everyone runs or fights or sleeps, skipping stones over shapes to lay joy or rest or grief. This next one's called Where I Come From. I come from the finger of God, electrically rolled in wind, nest burned trash and grumbling stomachs. Beat rug, onion sleight of hand, Mud bug crawled out the dirt and spit out mouth hot breath all over under clothes and roaches. Some snow and broken nipple milk, skylights up pink and stabs you, floats by, squandered babies sloughed off, hammered gold clutched and threaded through flesh. I stepped on a slug under tow, hair blown and bloated, electric air shape and dewy breath rolled me in. Mountains overgrown with vines made heavy and sunk. Brackish debutante and soft AC pat pat on the back and men who take care, ripped up decisions, mountain shoes and walk. Dirt and mouth possessions, passions and violation as birthright. Changed ears, summer's hell with no watermelon, winter with no poem, holy, uh, holy book and holy odes and holy channels of mountain water body in the mud of it, moldy placeholder of mossy bed. Robes and stamen stains crushed petals and paste. I come from mud pits with snakes. I come from flashes skylit. I come from meteors and whistled space. Space whistled, whistled me in after drums hit hand beats and some asses jiggled. Curiosity's face brought me here. Cut up mountains, catapult bridal veils, and perfect fruit foraged greens brought me here. Turtle blood, chickpea paste, rash skin, and ocean is where I come from. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much, Carissa. That was amazing. Um, and thank you, Ito and Yasi, for this awesome conversation. Thank you for your generosity today. Um, everyone, Thank you who tuned in um, and please join us on Monday at 1 p.m. 
for a conversation with Andy Goldsworthy and Jason Rosenfeld. We'll also have the poet Charles Theonia um, to read um, on Monday. So please join us and thank you again. Um, and you should all be able to activate your mics if you'd like to say goodbye as you leave. Um, thank you so much again. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Bertrand Grail. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Ito. Thank you, Yasi. Thank, thank, thank you, Ito. Thank you. Thanks, Ito. Thank you, Yasi. Yasi. Thank you. I love the Thank poem. you for your yeah. verbs. Thank you yeah, so much. Thank you. Love the, love the thank poem. you. <laughs> How was your move, Ito? Was it okay? Half done. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Is it also live and, and work in the same space? Okay. <laughs> studio okay. is the other side. Okay. Great. I'm not in the studio yet. Okay. Well, we can't wait to see you. Thank you so much for the conversation. Yeah. Thank you so much. Send it in peace. And uh, happy, happy Labor Day weekend also. Yeah, happy holiday happy weekend. Day. Yeah. yeah you too, Jason. Go crazy, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bye, you guys. Okay. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Jess. Love to see the familiar faces. Bye, yeah. everyone.